Well, hello, friends. Welcome to session one of What Methodists Believe. My name is Pastor Angelo. I serve as the pastor at 519 Church, and I'm going to be your guide on this journey. I want to say thank you for being part of this with me. If you are taking this class on your own, or if you're taking it with a group of others, I want to invite you um, right at the start to make sure that you utilize the application guide. You'll find it linked to this video. You can download it, you can um, use it digitally, or you can print it out and hard copy if that works better for you. There's going to be a lot of great resources, extra notes, um, questions for you to consider in the application guide tied to each session. And then I've also included a bibliography because the reality is that, you know, I teach this course um, because others taught me. And so um, helpful books that I've read, resources that I've utilized to prepare this material, I've linked to all of that in the bibliography and you can find that in the application guide as well. But I would just love to invite you straight away, make sure you have access to, to the application guide and utilize it. Um, the purpose of this course is, is simple. You know, it exists so that our church might develop a deeper understanding for an appreciation of the theological foundations of this movement known as Methodism. As long as I've been serving United Methodist churches and even being someone who found their way to a United Methodist church, the reality is, is that people, people come to, to the Methodist church from all over. You know, I've, I've <clears throat> served churches with people who, you know, didn't even identify as United Methodists. Maybe, maybe they came from another denomination. Um, maybe they've, they've been Presbyterian or Baptist or Anglican or Catholic. That's my story. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church and actually um, confirmed in the Catholic Church or, or people who um, came from more non-denominational expressions of faith or people who came from, from no faith at all um, or from having been outside of church for many, many years. There's something about Methodism that creates a wide enough tent for people with such varying degrees of you know, belief, um, scriptural interpretation, theological understanding. It creates this really wide tent for people to find a home um, together. And, and for as messy as that can be at times, I believe it's beautiful. But I don't just believe it's beautiful. I believe it's purposeful. I believe there's a reason to that. And that is where my passion lies. Because I was sitting in seminary in a class on Methodism, and I remembered thinking to myself, it was like something clicked for me, and I said, oh, that's why I'm Methodist. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm in seminary. That's why I keep going to Methodist churches. That's why no matter where else I go, like I find my home with this tribe. And, and the reality was that in that moment, I thought, why did I have to go to seminary for someone to tell me this? And so it's been a passion of mine in each church that I've served to offer some form of course uh, that, that helps us understand what Methodists believe, and, and if I could add a subheading to that, and why it matters, because I believe it matters. I believe it matters in beautiful ways. I believe it matters so much for our life, and, and I just want to share that with you over these next several sessions. So I'm going to let you know what it is that we're going to talk about, and then we're going to jump into session one, and there is a lot of content today. I'm going to do my best to, to share it quickly with you. <clears throat> and, and I just, you know, if, if you have any follow-up questions that, that you know, the, the application guide doesn't help you um, maybe work through or you, you still have the questions after wrestling with the content, please reach out to me. Um, you, can, you can email me, angelo at 519church.org. I would love to, to connect with you further. The, the beauty of, of creating this content in video form is that, you know, you can access it at any time at any time. And so whenever you're, you're listening, however you're listening and, and watching, welcome. Over the next several sessions, we are going to dive deeper into the concept of belief and, and what it is actually that Methodists believe. Today we're going to talk about 
the historical context of Methodism, how Methodism came to be. Um, in session two, we're going to learn about what our theological task is. We're going to learn about the two terms that are really going to shape how we talk about belief, theology, and doctrine. Maybe you've heard those two words in the church before, but you're not really sure what they mean or how they differ. They're different words. They're often used interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable. They're different. They mean different things. So we're going to learn how to define theology and doctrine. In session three, we're going to take that theology and doctrine, and we're going to use it to talk about grace and salvation. So what is it that Methodists believe about grace, and what is it that Methodists believe about salvation? And in session four, we're going to talk about Scripture and the Bible and how our understanding of theology and doctrine um, also impacts the way that we read Scripture and interpret Scripture together. And then in session five, in session five, we're going to talk about really the, the, what we call the two beautiful hands of Methodism, works of piety and works of holiness or mercy, sorry. We're going to talk about the two beautiful hands of Methodism, works of piety and works of mercy. And, and we look forward to sharing each of those things with you. But as I said, session one, historical context, and, and I'm going to try to fly through some material, but, but hopefully it's, it's connected in such a way that, that, that it, can, it can really make sense for us. Um, so how did Methodism come to be? Well, the, the founder of Methodism, if you will, is a man by the name of John Wesley. Maybe you've heard that name before. Um, John Wesley is the founder of Methodism. He was born in 1703. Um, and so this movement of Methodism is something that would really begin in the mid-1700s while Wesley found himself at Oxford University in England. But to know about why, why Wesley would form this movement, you need to understand a little bit of the, the background context within that. First of all, first of all, um, <clears throat> again, Wesley's living in England, which if you remember um, from your you know, history classes and social studies classes in, in school, and chances are you remember learning about a certain king in England, um, King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII is an important figure in English history because that was the monarch that separated England from the Catholic Church. Um, in 1534, through the Act of Suprem Supremacy, King Henry named himself the head of the Church of England. It was for a really awful reason. He wanted to divorce his wife. He wanted an annulment, if you will, <clears throat> so that he could remarry. Um, but that moment in time, the, the English Reformation, the creation of the Church of England, is what would begin to create the, the soil for the seed of Methodism to be planted in. If you fast forward into the, the 1700s, what you'll find is um, an English religious landscape that that finds itself split, and not like we would know anything about that, right? Not like we would um, know anything about groups of people being unable to agree on something, but, but this was the reality for, you know, the Church of England early on. You see those dates, 1534, the Act of Supremacy that I just talked about, the 39 Articles of Religion that are written in the several years following. Those Articles of Religion will be more important um, in our next session. But the two primary concepts within the religious landscape at the time were, were deism and pietism, all right? And deism really came up with the, the Enlightenment, okay? A, a different relationship with an appreciation for knowledge, scientific knowledge, reason. Um, so so there, was a, there was a group of people who believed in a concept of a supernatural creator that was based on reason, but that didn't have a lot of... Um, or any interaction with, with humanity. So this wasn't like an active God, if you will, but, but more of a passive God. Um, whereas pietism was the belief in pursuing holiness, all right? Pursuing holiness and that it was best done 
through small groups devoted to personal piety and scriptural holiness. Those words are going to be super important when we talk about what Methodists believe. Piety and holiness. Piety and holiness. So, you know, a group of people believing that really actually following Jesus and having that be something that takes root in your life and transforms your life, that's what is most important in religion. And so Wesley's father, Wesley's father, John Wesley's father, Samuel Wesley, was a part of something called the SPCK, the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. And here's what it believed. It believed that Reformation, all right, so if if there was this feeling in society that, you know, we were going to be one step removed from a really um, from a really intentional life of discipleship. This was the deist approach. Um, they felt that they needed to reform that. So their, their goal was never to break off and start something new. They didn't want to break off from the Church of England and start a whole new church. Um, but the reality was that, that they needed to reform what was. Maybe you've heard the phrase, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, my stepdad used to say, the grass is greener where you water it where you water it. And, and this was the thought of reformation. We're not going to go start something new, but we're going to reform what is. We're going to water the grass, if you will. And so that was the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, that discipleship happened one person at a time, not in really large, broad brushstrokes. And if you think about it, we believe that to be true, especially in Methodism. That's why we value things like these, like classes, like places where we can get into smaller groups, smaller communities, where we can take big churches and really break them down into smaller units, because ultimately what we believe our, our goal is, is to help make disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and that's you. That's me. Um, we are engaging in that work <clears throat> together. Um, but Wesley's dad was part of the SPCK, and when Wesley would go to college, um, he would actually be asked by his younger brother Charles to help Charles and his friends live a life of intentional piety and discipleship as John Wesley was doing, and, and help lead them in that. And so they would create the Holy Club, the Holy Club. And it really was a club that lived within the reality of what the SPCK had said was true, which was, you know, not not painting in broad brushstrokes, but really thinking about each individual. Um, the Holy Club was a club that really focused on, you know, intentional, purposeful discipleship in a smaller group format. And so that was part of, of the seedbed for <clears throat> Methodism. Now, John Wesley was an Anglican priest, and he was his whole life. He died an Anglican priest, so it's important to remember his goal was never to start a new Methodist denomination. Um, but what happened was, as part of the Holy Club, as you might imagine, you know, people at the college would um, jeer and they would make fun of. And, and one of the ways they made fun of this group that, that Wesley had put together was by calling them Methodists because they were so methodical about the way that they lived out their faith. Um, but, but Wesley started to put these things together in small groups, in bands. And, you know, they, these would all be people within the Church of England. But now they were saying that they were also part of this Methodist movement that was much more intentional about the ways that they were living into lives of discipleship. And so as all of that is happening, you have some major historical events occurring. So in um, 1736, John Wesley arrives as a missionary in Georgia and has an experience in Georgia um, that, that causes him to think about, you know, how the movement might expand into the colonies. Well, and we know what happens later in the 1700s. There's this little thing called the American Revolution, right? And you might imagine that once the American Revolution happened, it wasn't very popular to be in America and consider yourself part of the Church of England, right? Because um, now, you know, we've, we've created our own thing. We've, we've done a new thing, and here we go. Um, 1784, we have the Christmas Conference at Lovely Lane Chapel in Baltimore, Maryland. 
and this was the founding conference of the newly independent Methodists, all right? And so that's how, you know, this thing that, that started as a club at Oxford University becomes eventually this, this Methodist church that's its own independent denomination. Um, but, but the reason for it is because there was a deep belief that, that if we were going to do discipleship well, it needed to be done intentionally and with great purpose. And so Wesley, you know, ordained some people to go and, and be bishops in America. And um, one of those individuals was Francis Asbury. He was ordained on Christmas Day and named the co-superintendent alongside Thomas Koch. And Francis Asbury, Thomas Koch, really our first two um, bishops. And we have a bookstore called Cokesbury and or Cokesbury, and that's where the name comes from. It combines those two names. Um, in American Methodism, as it expanded, you had the rise of the circuit rider. This was part of, you know, as, as Wesley was, was, you know, leaning into this movement of Methodism more, um, he began to experiment with preaching outdoors and what that was and, and moving around and preaching to, to different groups of people of embodying a spirit that, you know, um, parishes weren't going to be primarily identified by their pastor, but really by the people within that community. And so, and so circuit riders would go around to different, to different charges um, and, and they would preach and then they'd go and ride to the next one and they would preach and they'd go ride to the next one and they would preach. And all in the in-between time, it was really the job of those local communities of faith to go about the work of being the church within the world around them. And again, it's, it's deeply rooted in this belief that, you know, we're going to be people who are following Jesus. We're not following any person. We're following Jesus, and Jesus is calling us to make a difference. And so here's how we're going about doing that. And Francis Asbury was an important aspect of, of that particular history. Um, if you read history books about Francis Asbury, he's often referred to as America's bishop. Um, it, it's said that he traveled probably close to 270,000 miles um, on horseback and preached some 16,000 odd sermons. And here is what I want to um, share with you um, to close this time. I want to share with you how this movement of Methodism you know, hits your living room or, or wherever it is that, that you're watching this now. Um, but Francis Asbury dies in 1816. And by 1844, um, there would be one million Methodists in America with 4,000 um, preachers riding circuits on horseback. Um, in 1869, um, a man by the name of James Hines became the first circuit rider all right, to include a charge, a station, um, in a small community in North Carolina on his schedule. That small community um, in 1870 would officially become the Apex Charge. All right, so 1870, it's officially the Apex Charge. In 1917, um, that Apex Charge would plant roots and find a home at 100 South Hughes Street right here in Apex, North Carolina, at the sanctuary that's still standing there today. Um, and in 2020, which is when we're recording this video, in 2020, um, the Apex Charge is celebrating 150 years as a worshiping congregation. And, and we are all part of that history together. And so, you know, from, from the English Reformation to today, we see the way um, that that this belief that, that Christian discipleship happens one person at a time, um, that, that we are meant to be people who are faithfully following Jesus together, who are pursuing piety and scriptural holiness. Um, this, is, this is why this movement has taken off really everywhere it, it planted itself, including right here in Apex, North Carolina. Um, friends, 
Uh, today, I just want to share that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm Methodist is because I have had the, the great fortune of experiencing that reality for myself, you know, coming to a church that, that really showed me how to take discipleship to a different level, how to understand it as my own journey, but one I didn't have to do alone, one that I could do with others, um, but very intentionally and purposefully in, in being in a larger church in smaller pockets of community. And, and that, that foundation didn't happen overnight. It's been part of the makeup of who we've been all along. In our next session, we're going to learn about how this foundation leads us to understand what it is that we're actually talking about when we talk about theology. And so if we're going to say, here's what Methodists believe, well, what do we consider belief to be? And I can't wait to share that session with you. Um, go to the application guide, check out the, the questions for consideration, and I'll see you in session two.